All right, so um, this is what was said before, the title of uh, what I'm going to talk about. Uh, and I just want to start by saying a very few words about uh, e-mobility in, in general. So the, the common understanding and insight is that electrical vehicles are coming and they are here to stay. Uh, this is a big revolution, obviously, in the field of uh, transportation, uh, be it commercial or private. Uh, the battery has a specific role uh, in that e-motors and battery will be required no matter what, even if um, fuel cells or synthetic fuels uh, play a significant role, there will always be the need to recuperate uh, motion energy and store it and reuse it for acceleration later on uh, in order to improve um, energy efficiency. So e-mobility is here to stay, but batteries are even more here to stay due to those reasons. And there is a lot of discussion about what is the right uh, technology, maybe hybrid uh, fuel cells or, or synthetic fuels are the future. Uh, I'm wholeheartedly convinced there will be an application for each of those topics and the real world uh, will be a mix of all these technologies. And uh, we are happy to be part of that. And uh, as much as it is a challenge, it's also obviously a big opportunity for everyone involved in that field. When we look at data, everyone has seen these curves. Uh, I don't want to expand on the details because you're familiar with that already. What it shows is simply the um, global demand and production capacity in gigawatt hours of uh, lithium ion storage capacity in cells predominantly over time and it's split per region and uh, there are a few features i'd like to point out number one is the solid curves are as you see below here the demand estimations the more conservative and the more aggressive version and you see both of them are uh, showing an exponential character. And in the past, in the recent couple of years, uh, the mechanism always was that reality has been at least at the higher end of expectations rather than the lower end. The solid bars um, that are shown here are the announced production capacity per region. The bars are higher because uh, a factory takes time to ramp, so the capacity is not available from day one. Uh, the, there is competition, so not all factories are always working at 100% loading, and uh, so that's why the bars are higher. Um, now, two points are of interest. Number one, on the right side, you see this pie chart. And it clearly shows that in volume, passenger cars are by far the largest contribution. Uh, 3C, that is computers, consumer products, um, um, are also important. Commercial vehicles are next. Uh, they are very important in terms of storage capacity, but in terms of usage, they are actually considering the CO2 footprint a much, much larger contribution because they run all day. So basically the investment, um, oh, I was probably hitting the wrong button here. Um, so the investment is earning back its money uh, around the clock. So that's why there is a big leverage on commercial vehicles. So, and last not least, uh, one little detail is when you look at the chart in absolute growth figures and relative growth figures, yeah. Europe is the region in the world where the growth is expected to be largest worldwide uh, for the next five years because uh, it's 
impacting on decline uh, in our region here. Now, what does KUKA have to do with this? Uh, everyone, uh, not most everyone, associates uh, the color orange with, with our company and uh, obviously six axis robots. Uh, but I always like to point out, yes, this is true, but actually two thirds of our business is solution business. And a large share of that uh, revolves around automotive production. Um, so what do we do uh, in automotion, uh, in, in uh, automation, in, in production technology, uh, in the field of e-mobility? Uh, it's actually quite a few areas uh, where this is uh, of relevance for us. Um, there is, uh, for example, the EDU, we're uh, making electrical motors, uh, gearboxes, hybrid gears. We're making uh, equipment for production of components, uh, welding solutions, friction stir welding. We're obviously um, in, in body structures, in uh, assembly battery system installation technologies, sealing technology. So it's, it's a wide basket of things. Uh, that we are engaged in. My focus today, however, will be on this field, which is uh, the module and pack assembly for batteries for electric cars. Um, just to clarify a little bit the terminology, because we came to realize that uh, different people and organization use different terms for the same things. Uh, we are commonly talking about cells, modules, and packs. They come in basically three fundamental shapes and flavors, which is cylindrical and prismatic and pouch. And what we do is we are helping in these uh, activities that are symbolized in yellow, which is the assembly of modules and of packs. So this is our focus. We are not currently um, significantly involved in the process of cell production, um, but we are looking at uh, closely watching uh, future uh, evolution of cell technology. So when there is a new technology coming around, uh, we might uh, also engage there. And likewise, we're watching technologies around that field. So specifically, we're also having a very close look uh, on fuel cell technology and production. So this is the one pager um, that tries to capture very concisely and briefly our history and our scope of activities. So uh, we are engaged in this field of battery assembly for about a decade by now. Uh, Ten years ago, uh, the focus was much more on um, developing the laser welding technologies for contact welding. So this was, uh, to a large extent, uh, R&D activities and exploration of how you can build a battery in the first place, where we supported some major players and um, about 2005 or so, um, the, the field took off uh, primarily in Asia at that time with uh, production lines. And uh, you all know how that went in the last five years. Uh, so now we really have a grassroots movement, uh, a broad movement towards e-mobility. We have built about uh, two and a half, three dozen lines by now, both module and pack. And we've actually realized and worked uh, with technology in all um, three cell types, cylindrical, prismatic, as well as pouch. The customer base that we've worked with has significantly evolved um, um, compared to the more traditional old days in automotive production. So beyond the OEMs themselves, um, the tier ones, uh, have uh, engaged in that field as well, but also uh, a lot of startups, uh, new OEMs, uh, as well as battery manufacturers, because now um, the battery 
or the, the electrical car has evolved a little bit to becoming um, yeah, maybe a little more like a consumer electronic product with four wheels. So other players have access to build such a car as well. You know, if you just look at the announcements from Sony or even Apple engaging in the field right now. The hotspots geographically are obviously the USA, where Tesla uh, basically started the hype and proved that it's possible and can be of interest to the broad public. Um, Asia has turned it into a mainstream uh, new trend. And Europe uh, is catching on now and following that trend and uh, my mind anyway uh, also uh, taking it to some new levels you know throwing the full rigor of, of development and uh, careful uh, process uh, activities uh, to, to make it even better the focus has been on fully and semi-automated uh, solutions but uh, also uh, sometimes we do prototype cells um, and manual installation if it's uh, a low volume let me just show, shift that one screen a little bit so i can see uh, we've done projects in all shapes and sizes so uh, running from the you know lower mid six, six digit range to uh, 30, 40, 50 million very large projects. Uh, we are typically engaged uh, from the very beginning, process development, concept uh, validation, prototype development, uh, to obviously the core business designing, manufacturing, installation of lines, and we are also uh, open to doing turnkey uh, projects as well. Now, what is so special about battery production? Um, what is special is that it's a quite long and complex uh, production chain involving typically 50, 60, 70 individual process steps. So what I show here is just an example. Everyone is doing it maybe a little bit according to their own recipes, but uh, generally, it starts with handling, with uh, depalletizing, with inspection of cells, uh, visually, uh, geometrically, electrically, cleaning with uh, ionized air, plasma, alcohol, applying some insulation, uh, which can be a foil, a sheet, uh, even a solid structure. Then the cells are put into the module, so typically stacked. Uh, pressed uh, to uh, nominal dimensions and then they're welded into a frame. You have some tooling to be installed. You have to connect the bus bar to the contact welding. Um, and then you test the module, resistance testing, um, open circuit voltage. Uh, you do a cover, you do a battery management system and so forth. So I don't want to go through all the details in the pack as well, but the point is it's a very long process chain, um, which has handling processes, welding, dispensing, gluing, electrical testing, mechanical validation. So it's coming from uh, a lot of different fields and it all goes into the same line, which is, um, in my experience, a little bit special about battery. Um, to give you a feeling of uh, cycle times and speed of this production, I've put together some exemplary numbers. So a module production has a typical output of somewhere between 30 and 180 or so modules per hour. So that translates into a cycle time between two minutes and 20 seconds to produce one module. So that's already reasonably fast. But when you consider that each module contains one, maybe two dozen individual cells, the handling time for a cell can actually go down to 100 milliseconds. So that's already um, a pretty strong speed requirement, uh, which in combination with handling 
lithium ion cells, which by definition are hazardous material, and the precision uh, requirements, uh, that's already an interesting task. The characteristics of the pack assembly are somewhat different. Here you have a rate of production somewhere between, uh, no, not now. Um, a rate of production of uh, maybe 10 minutes per pack, sometimes 15 minutes, but in larger applications, also down to two minutes or even higher. So one pack corresponds to one car, two minutes per pack corresponds to about, um, depending on the production schedule, 150, 180,000 cars per year. So, and then again, each pack contains several modules. So the handling time per module can also range between uh, only a few seconds all the way to maybe two minutes. So this is the characteristics uh, of these battery production lines. Um, along with the different cycle times uh, come different characteristics in the size and dimension of the things handled um, with um, the automation requirements. Uh, because if it's a high repetition, it's a no-brainer to do um, as much automation as possible. When it's a very lower repetition rate, uh, you have the option to do things manually because depending on the region and on the production plan, this may be more um, efficient commercially. Uh, this is um, a layout of a grown-up module production line uh, that we conceived. Uh, I can show this picture because it hasn't been exactly realized in that exact um, design, uh, but it gives you an idea of the complexity. Um, what you typically do is for some key processes, the cell preparation, where you have the high-speed cell uh, handling, you parallelize processes um, also typically for the welding here in the middle and then further downstream um, when the parts or the units handled per time are less then it's uh, more sequentialized uh, depending on the footprint availability you may have to squeeze a little bit go to a second floor use overhead conveyors to squeeze it into the production area so uh, just to give an idea of how such a line can look. Um, now the point is, uh, since this is all very new and everyone does it a little bit different, uh, there is a whole lot of secrecy about it. So it's uh, not so easy to, uh, to share what we've actually done. Um, but I have some examples I can show you anyway. This is just a quick chart. You can maybe uh, later look at it in more detail, summarizing the key processes uh, which have some technological challenges and depth. So just to highlight laser welding, both electrical and structural. Um, here I'd like to point out that we have a laser technology center near the University of Aachen where we are closely uh, working with the forefront of uh, research in that field. Uh, so we are quite deeply involved into this part of the process. Dispensing, which is typically critical for thermal contacting uh, of modules, uh, you know, either to a cooler in the module or uh, to the pack. Uh, this is a quite tricky process because these dispensed materials are rheologically quite uh, interesting. Um, we have quite some experience there. Typically, we have taping uh, processes in the game. We have developed our own taping applications. You'll see some in the video I'm going to show. Then there is obviously leak testing involved for both uh, the housing itself 
as well as the associated pooling system. And then a bunch of more straightforward processes like uh, surface preparation, electrical testing, curing, varnishing, things like that, which we as an integrator uh, need to handle and uh, integrate. And then the handling itself, which uh, is not just taken apart and putting it from A to B, but also aligning, uh, pressing uh, to a nominal force, to a nominal dimension, and so forth. And that uh, needs to be combined, obviously, with the logistics of a large line in terms of data handling, um, redundancy, uh, security concepts, and so forth. So one example that we can openly share is uh, this. Uh, I put on the right side uh, a link to um, a web location where you can uh, find an application report that has been published as well as a YouTube video. I'm going to show part of that video, but you can find the whole thing uh, on YouTube. This is um, prismatic cell pack assembly line that we have built for the German tier one Elring Klinger. Um, and uh, I have a short video here, uh, which is focusing on the, what we call the front end. So basically the cell preparation until the stacking. Uh, for time reasons, I'm skipping the rest, but I'm gonna say a few words about that. So we zoom in, um, we have one string for cell preparation here, which is speed optimized by using a linear motor concept. So it starts by a robot testing each individual cell and putting it into a carrier. Uh, the carrier is uh, part of a linear motor, so we can control each uh, cell in speed and position individually. And this helps us to increase throughput here is linear and then in the process part um, it moves from the conveyor to the linear motor part so we can adjust um, the speed uh, independently and uh, thereby improve uh, the availability for the process time then we apply uh, adhesives we pull off the liner um, you have to take uh, great care about the polarity of the cells. So uh, you need to control where is plus, where is minus, sort the cells, apply the liner uh, and the foil on the correct side of the cell uh, and sort it for the next processes and then uh, assemble it um, in the right sequence and the right orientation. So focusing on the stacking, this is a time critical process. Right, so uh, the module may have a cycle time of only 100 seconds of process time, and you need to do 10, 20 cells, so you need to parallelize. We pre-stack in the right orientation, then uh, you see the second robot taking two pairs at the time and putting them down uh, to uh, save uh, process time to generate uh, the stack, and then uh, the stack is pressed, goes into uh, the welding chamber and then to the downstream processes. So as I said, you can look at the whole video later on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, the second example that we are authorized to publicly um, uh, reference uh, is a pack uh, assembly line for uh, another German tier one, Webasto. The application uh, for this pack is uh, for um, electrical buses. Uh, so it's a commercial vehicle application. Again, you can uh, download um, the use case description. So for this line, I just wanted to um, have the focus on two aspects. So one aspect is the conveyance concept. For pack line, uh, it's typically an interesting discussion what conveyance to use, and we are not saying there is the one solution. It really depends on the needs, on the throughput, on the space availability, etc. But in this example, um, the choice was to use AGVs, 
Um, the ATVs we used here is actually a cart and trailer concept. So the battery, which may easily weigh five to seven, eight hundred kilograms, is sitting on a heavy load cart, which is pulled by a trailer. So you can decouple the trailer from the cart. This gives you more flexibility. And since uh, the, the trailer is carrying the load, uh, you can design uh, the, the tractor uh, a little bit more efficiently. So the benefits you have uh, for this approach is uh, we apply here a kiosk. So in the line, I hope you can see my mouse. The production goes in a circle, essentially counterclockwise. We have one big automation station, which is the cell positioning dispensing. And in the beginning, there is a kiosk where all the little parts that go into that pack are put into specific containers, uh, drawers in the cart. So the parts travel with the battery so you can centralize the logistics for the line to a large extent. So the HEVs follow a magnetic stripe. This is uh, quite cost efficient and straightforward. Um, using HEVs, you can easily scale cards, but you can also add cells by simply putting on another tape and doing a little uh, reprogramming of the path. So in this line, basically, you have the preparation, the, the automatic stations where the cells are put in, and then you have the connection of the cables and cooling pipes and testing and high voltage uh, um, BMC um, installation, and then this contained garage for safety reasons. That's where you have the end of line test and reverse stations. So a little video uh, showing the dispensing process. So what we do is we measure uh, the housing, we apply uh, the um, uh, thermal uh, contact uh, material, we find with the camera the screw locations, we place the module in the right spot, um, this is uh, an automation cell with four robots for cycle time. This is the time critical part. We need to be um, parallelizing uh, the individual steps uh, to, to make it quick and fast. The challenge here is to control the process, factoring in the real life tolerances you find in the parts. So the module is finished, it drives out uh, of the automation cell, goes in this case into a few manual stations, the cables are connected, uh, the lid goes on, and then um, since it's a, a use case uh, for commercial, commercial vehicles, typically you have two or more uh, layers that go on top of each other. Uh, in this uh, application due to cycle times, it's done manually. So in substance, this is about as much as I can tell you today, given um, the uh, time budget. <laughs> uh, I need a conclusion chart, so I have put together some little thoughts still. So what makes battery assembly so interesting and challenging? It's a new market which still evolves quickly. There is strong market dynamics. Um, demands go up, uh, predictions change rapidly. The product evolves frequently, very quickly. So I haven't seen one project so far where there wasn't any changes in the project execution. Sometimes it's just details. Sometimes even the designers decide to exchange crucial processes in the setup process for a line. I mentioned the number of processes, uh, performance, yes, it's very important uh, in capacity, but also in reliability of the line. Due to the variations, you need flexibility, also scalability, automation level is uh, important to find the right level. Uh, the product quality is extremely important because it's uh, safety critical and it's quite costly. So exchanging a battery uh, is a logistical hassle. 
uh, there are requirements to track and trace not only parts but also process parameters so that you can find um, a root cause uh, analysis um, if a product turns out to be faulty further downstream and then obviously you need to be cost efficient what does this mean it means you need a strong and trustful partnership with a supplier of your choice who has experience and expertise because given the market environment there is no room for unnecessary delays and trial and error and failures and it's uh, very important also to have a local presence and support uh, because it will be necessary to closely work together in the execution of a process with a high bandwidth and a significant amount of pragmatism and active cooperation as well. So this is what an ideal partner looks like. And of course, I want you to consider uh, that we could be the partner of your choice uh, in your future endeavors uh, in this area. Orange Intelligence.